This is something that I've been working on for quite a long time. Um, back when I first saw the uh, great treasures of, of Celtic metalwork back in the 1970s, you know, how are they do it, you know, because it, it appeared, everybody said, well, it must have been lost wax carving, but uh, this particular technique is called um, chip carving or curb schnitt, which is the style that quite a large majority of the interlace and, and some other elements of, of Celtic design were done in, um, in insular art from, say, the 7th, 8th, 9th centuries. And uh, this is the Arda Chalice. This part here, is, this is all done in wire work here, filigree, gold filigree. But this part here is also filigree. This is cast chip carving. This brooch is also cast. And here's a, some details of the Hunterston brooch from Scotland, also uh, apparently cast. And looking at this, I said, well, you know, if I can really study and practice, I guess I can do this. But um, it turns out it didn't really have the tools because uh, jewelers have a tendency, or modern metal workers have a tendency to work from positive models. You make something out of wax or you make it out of wood or make it out of something that you can manipulate and then you take an impression off of it. There are these... Uh, mold fragments that the archaeologists have found, um, although archaeologists haven't found these because uh, I made them. Uh, so, <laughs> and I apologize, I, I meant to bring some of this to show you, but it's all, it's all down at my shop. Some of you may have seen it uh, last night. These are impressions from clay, and this was done from a wax model. This was an impression thing. This would be a bivalve clay model where you, you know the back of it would be closed up and then you destroy the clay to uh, to get the piece out so it's a one-shot mold now clay has been used quite extensively you know the, it agrees with the archaeological record very nicely because we've got these fragments um, and it's it's not just clay there's a um, magic ingredient that, that makes it uh, work a lot better for casting uh, Clay is, when it's fired, it's, it's hard, it's dense, it's not very porous. When you cast metal, you want, the, you want to be able to do several things. You want to be able to break it away. So you want something that contains the hot metal, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't um, you know, isn't so hard that you can't get it off. And then you need to get the gases out because you go pour the metal in there, there's already hot air or hot uh, fumes from the fire in it. And um, so for those two reasons, uh, you, you need it to, do, to be able to breathe. So the way you, you get this uh, agricultural byproduct, which uh, <laughs> this, this was another contribution that the McRae family has made to local Celtic art. Because, uh, these are, are their cows. <laughs> And uh, I asked them if I could, uh, could um, come get some, and they said, well, we'd be glad to give you a ration of shit whenever you want it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you, uh, here I'm mixing the clay and the, um, clay and the dung together. One of the things I learned from this is actually fresh is not good. It's actually better. <laughs> it's better if you let it work for a while and all the little bits of fiber and undigested grain and stuff decompose a little bit because what the what the um, manure is doing is it's uh, creating a void after the clay is fired so it makes it makes the clay porous and there's there's plenty of evidence that this was done in medieval times there's um, several um, records you know how-to books Theophilus who was an 11th century monk gave very specific formulas on how to do this also Cellini working in the uh, um, Renaissance talks about it, and also in India and Africa, uh, there's traditional cultures that still cast this way. And you can use this for, as an impression mold. You can, you know, press your your model into a, into the clay and make a mold that way. So I'm putting a back on it. Then you fill it with the hot metal. You fire the clay and you fill it while it's still hot. Take it right out of the kiln, pour the metal in. You don't let the 
ceramic cool down because it helps to helps them out of flow. And um, or another way to do it, but there they are. Um, the silver one is the, the model. The brass piece there is is the casting. And then here's a fragment of the of the mold. It shrinks a little bit because the, the well hot things get smaller when they um, when they cool off. But also um, the ceramic itself shrinks about 12, 13 percent. So if you compare these two side by side, one's you know, significantly, noticeably bigger than the other. Uh, I love this picture. We tried and tried to get more, more like this. We can see the outline of the of the hot metal, just keeping that one area, area of the uh, piece warm. And you know, it only stayed like that for a few seconds. I, I would have preferred to have it upright so it made sense. We tried to do this over again several times and. Photographing hot, glowing things is, you know, it fools the digital cameras. And so um, some of the pictures are not as great as they ought to be. This is, these are wax models. Uh, I didn't make special model wax. I, these are from rubber molds, things that I've made other ways. That's a whole other story because as I've shown these things to um, various people, they say, well, you know, Lost wax has done such and such that as if I had no idea what lost wax was. And I've done, what, we do thousands of pieces of lost wax casting every year. And, uh, you know, it's what I do for a living. So I have, when I'm talking to, uh, like, the Insular Art Conference, I have to put it out there front. I do understand lost wax casting. So when, if what I'm talking about isn't not because I'm ignorant of that, uh, <laughs> those methods. <laughs> so, anyhow. Um, Doing something flat like this brooch is one thing because you can make an impression of it, but what about the stem of the Ardot chalice? Because it goes all the way around. It could have been cast flat and then um, you know, bent around. It could have been, you know, there's, there's a bunch of possibilities. But in any case, making the original model is, is a, is a, it's also a problem because how are you going to make those that those kinds of shapes? Even when I got really good at lost wax carving or lost wax casting and wax carving and modeling, those that particular style and look of of, of uh, interlace was not easy to do. And uh, in fact, you tended to do things with a very different look if it was uh, if it was made in a positive model. So here are some things that people, this, this bone has been shown over and over again as uh, how they did it. You know, they carved it in bone and then they made an impression with the clay and did the, and I don't think that's true. I mean, it's possible, but it's not, I have not seen any bone carving that's as crisp as even the sort of lower quality of, of the curb snip casting. Now this other piece is, uh, you know, a finished piece later Chip carving is also kind of an unfortunate word for trying to understand this technique because it's a it's a word that wood carvers use. And since the, the metal looked like carved wood, you know, the same kinds of shapes and things, people just sort of assumed it was the same technique. When, and once they started using the same word to describe it, it made it even less likely that you're going to uh, think outside the box in terms of understanding it because this is a technique that kind of disappeared. Um, I kind of got the clue, I was at the National Museum of Scotland, and a friend of mine went with, with me, and he was saying, how do they do this? How do they, you know, he wants the man and I explain this. I've been, I've been trying to understand this for 25 years, I, I don't know. And as I was looking at it, and I'd been thinking about mold making, I, could, I realized that these three brooches were very similar in, you know, the proportion here, the size of that, I mean, they're a little different, but the, the basic shape, all of these irregularities. This, this is the St. Ninian's Isle brooches, by the way. There were, there were 12 brooches and a bunch of other old silver that was found in 1958, I think, by a boy who was uh, 13 years old, and he volunteered to help this excavation, and he 
within about an hour on the job, he found the biggest, uh, most exciting horde of, of Celtic uh, artifacts of the 20th century. And I uh, actually had an email with him, he's an old man now, but he's, uh, um, and you can see at the bottom here, this is a picture, these are, the top pictures are ones the museum took, but at the bottom is a picture I took, and it's, normally these are shown in books straight on, but it, when you see them in real life, you can see those, you know, they stick up pretty high, you know, this little cusp and everything, that's, that's a really bold, bold thing. So, what I figured is that there must be something in common, and, I, I, and they were, there's some kind of a common mold, even though there's difference in the detail. You know, the, the, the interlace thing is different between all three of them. And what I discovered, okay, well, I just, in, in, I'll talk about it from here. If you made a, a mold of this, where all that detail is, is not way down in the bottom of those cells. In the mold, it's way up in the front, because the mold is, is the opposite of the, of, um, of the positive piece. So, I, it occurred to me that no, this stuff was carved in the mold. And once I started seeing it in terms of being carved in the mold, then I realized that the mold was carved all the way around. You know, the, the compass was used to lay out those arches. And you know, compass not just to lay them out, but to gouge them. You sharpen one end of the compass as a, as a gouge. And as I discovered this, we talked about uh, Michael Brenner a little earlier. He had been fascinated with uh, a certain number of brooches that were done in this chip carving thing. And he, he was mainly analyzing the mathematics of it, the symmetry. But one thing that bothered him, I don't have a picture of the whole brooch, but here's a detail. There's a hole right through this, this thing which was used to fasten a piece that's now lost that was uh, the cover. There's some other pieces on the other parts of the road, so we have a pretty good idea of what that was. And after I'd met him and talked to him, um, I, think, I think it was in Ireland, he, uh, he emailed me a picture of it that he had taken when he he'd examined it. And it happened that it, the email came in just as I was doing it. I'd been doing these experiments that day. And I took the picture that he'd emailed me. And I, I've been telling him, well, it, it wasn't such a big investment. You know, it looks like this thing must have taken a long time to carve. This is plaster here. It carves pretty well. Just pure gypsum plaster, plaster Paris. And I got his email pretty much within a minute of him sending it. I did this carving and made the, uh, this is like a plasticine play impression of that carving, and I emailed him back that picture <laughs> half an hour later, which I think convinced him that yes, you can do this fairly quickly. It's not uh, nearly as, as difficult as, uh, as it would appear if you were trying to do it from, from by carving the, the model first. So. What I, thinking it through, reverse engineering how these brooches would have been made, I uh, made this carving, which is about halfway through the brooch. Now you go into the, these areas here and carve the details. But I want to have three different molds, just like this one to start with. So I have to have a way to copy this thing, save all the trouble I went to to make it this far, and the way I think that would be an easy way to do this. This is the kind of thing that art students do in sculpture class all the time. You can make a clay impression of, uh, you know, it's regular potter's clay. You make a clay impression of a um, plaster piece. So, let's see. Actually, I made four of them. Made a clay impression and poured plaster over the, the clay impressions. And I broke up this one bar into four separate molds. And then went back in. You can see that I'm using the compass to kind of crisp it off. That's how it was done originally. And then using a V-shaped gouge going in and, and carving the, the interlace design. And to do a, a complete interlace, what you do is you just lay out the path as a single line and carve it very lightly. And then completely all the way around. Then go back and carve a little deeper, and carve a little deeper, make maybe four or five passes until the V 
you know, the wider end of that gouge is completely removed from the original surface. So you've got an inverted pyramid. And that inverted pyramid then makes this nice faceted kind of background. And then to make it go over and under, all you have to do is um, carve a little bit deeper where you want it to be in the oval. Because you've got you to think about it backwards. Uh, the, that brooch where that detail came from was a, a piece that had a lot of over and under errors in it, too. In fact, there's one place where it had seven overs in the row. Uh, <laughs> if I knew we were going to have that conversation just like that, I would have uh, tried to get another picture of that in here. But anyway, here's the three brooches, and th these are, you know, number 24, 25, and 26 from the, the, the hoard. These are uh, vents to let the air out, you know, so you one of the things about plaster that's different from the clay mold is the clay is very coarse, uh, but because of we put the dung in there. But uh, this stuff is not. And if you if you put stuff, but the regular uh, plaster investment I use for, for lost wax casting has been tempered with uh, well, a number of things. Powdered silica is what we use most. Of we don't use it. We buy all that stuff. But you can put in a little bit of talc. You can put in a little bit of anything. A little bit of clay, it makes it less um, porous and it breathes a little bit. So when, when the metal goes in, the gases can be absorbed into, into, um, into the body of the mold. But um, unfortunately, when you do that, it makes it so it doesn't carve very well. And, uh, and clay doesn't carve very well either that way. You know, it, the people uh, uh, that I was presenting this to as I went to these insular art conferences had a real tough time with the idea of plaster because there was no archaeological evidence of that. Well, there wouldn't be, because after you fire this and you use it, you break it, it turns to mud. It's just gone. It's a, it wouldn't last 1,200 years. It wouldn't last till next month, probably, if you left it outside. So um, anyhow, uh, I cast these, and these, are, these pieces here, are my my castings? They're my. Um, in fact, they in some ways they turned out a little bit better than the Saint Ninian's Isle brooches <laughs> <laughs> because uh, actually right here is a bit of a failure that is similar to that. See how there's the, this little edge here didn't quite fill to the edge. The metal didn't fill, and th there was a description of these by uh, Sir David Wilson, who uh, later became the um, the director of the British Museum. He was, he was talking about how worn these were because the edges were eroded back. They, they weren't eroded. They'd never, they'd never been there in the first place. These are castings. <laughs> these are castings that would have been, you know, chopped up and you know tried again if they, for whatever reason, quite a lot of the pieces had these these incomplete fills. Uh, so whoever was making them was really struggling with the, with their casting technique. Um, they finished them, they gilded them. They, you could tell that they'd never really been abused because you know, I've handled the originals, looked at them under a microscope. They're not all scratched up or anything. You know, the, the places where there's wear, where the gilding is worn off, where gilding is like gold plating, um, was the places that you'd handle it when you were using it. But they, they'd been taken care of quite carefully. Um, these are some other pieces at the top from the St. Ninian Zile Horde. Uh, David Wilson had pronounced with great authority that they were, they had been cast in a common blank and the detail had been carved in the metal separately. And he was, he was, you know, heading in the right direction. And I think the, one of the things that fooled him was this piece here, which has got a very much like a chip carving thing, and that one was carved in the metal. And if you look at it, it's quite obvious because you see all the burrs and scratches and stuff that you get if you, if you engraved it. So I think he looked at this, saw the evidence that betrayed how it was done, assumed that they were all done that way. And uh, I, you know, the National Museum of, of Scotland was very you know, accommodating to me. Got the whole, whole horde out and let me play with it and look at it under the microscope and handle it. And I was there for several hours. These little mysterious things, they're about as big as like a very large chicken egg maybe is about the scale of those. These, I believe, were made in a totally different way. I think they were made with lost wax casting, which is actually both of these techniques would be more difficult than the um, technique I'm proposing by 
carving directly in the plaster. Um, I won't. I don't have time to go into all how I know they were done that way. But um, but this this board quite remarkably shows three different ways to get the very very similar uh, look. And if with careful examination and looking at it with a craftsman's eye, you know, I've tried all of these ways of doing things, and I can kind of recognize the. Um, the evidence, but then there's also the um, the Tara brooch and the Hunterston brooch have surfaces that are whoops, let's see. that there it is. Like here, there's you can see a little bit of uh, the chip carving on the face of it, but then there's some on the edge too. Well, how would you make that mold? You know, it's it's kind of. You know, and I, I was thinking about this for a year, you know, thinking if you carved on this very thin piece, maybe that piece should be a more complicated multi-part mold. And then when I actually got a chance to look at it, I said, no, it wasn't. The, the face of it was carved, it was cast in it with a negative carving, and the edges were carved directly in the metal. And they were done very well. And Neve Woodfield, who's a, a, one of the leading scholars for Celtic metalwork. She was insisting, no, I've seen the scratches in the in the in the um, in the curve schmidt. I can I can, you can see the tool marks. And what she was referring to was these tool marks up in here, or this this surface. That was that was carved in the metal. They weren't all done that way. So I think people have make a mistake sometimes when they see evidence in one piece and presume that that uh, proves something for other pieces that are kind of similar. But it still creates the problem, what about the stem of the Ardot Chalice? Because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's three-dimensional. Well, I did some experiments. I found, yeah, you could carve that on the interior surface of the cylinder. If it's uh, that size, I was able to get the exact dimensions and make some, do some test pieces. And the National Museum of Ireland, uh, after a lot of jumping through hoops, they let me have some direct access to this, which is one of their greatest treasures. It's right up there with the, with the Book of Kells. So anyway, there's a three-part mold system I devised for this. And this is just, um, you, know, you can see on the viewer's right, carving on the inside of, of the cylinder. The cylinder was made around a, uh, well, a core. And then there's a, a third piece that's just like the funnel and the, the method to get it all together. There's going to be a few other uh, views of it. Laying it out on the inside proved to be the, the hardest thing to do. Uh, the cells of that piece, if you were to, those of you that are familiar with the five dot grid, those five dot grids, each cell would be about 2.1 millimeters. You know, for those of you that speak Fahrenheit, it's like uh, three, three thirty seconds of an inch or so. So um, these are the tools I use. There's, you know, very very simple uh, steel um, cutting tools. Um, you can you can sculpt plaster with a dull screwdriver, but if you have a very sharp tool, you can carve it a lot more uh, precisely. And uh, I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty small scale. The, the, the craftsman that was doing this was doing it just about as small as, as the material will allow you to. I actually think the piece would have been much more aesthetically pleasing if he did a bolder design because it's, it's really hard to see it from any more than, in fact, it's hard to see it in the display case when you're two feet away. But uh, my eyes at the time I was doing this were already maybe 57 years old or so and I needed a microscope to really see what I was doing. Uh, here's some more pictures of the of the um, thing. You can see if you my test for you know will this material work for um, chip carving was to make this little four hatch thing, and if it will leave a pyramid in the middle, it, it, it'll work. Um, you can do it in clay, maybe about one out of ten times. And I tried all kinds of clay bodies. Alfred University is famous for ceramics. I have plenty of potter friends who tried. Tried it many different variations. It works in plaster. I, I don't think there's much reason to keep pursuing uh, clay just so that it could possibly be in the um, archaeological record. But this is uh, this is a 
play impression. This is one of the nice things about this. As you're carving it, you can take a little impression. You can, I'm using oil plasticine, but you can use potter's clay the same way and get an idea of what, what your positive thing is going to look at, look like. Um, let's see. So my son and I, he's, there he is in the back row, he, uh, he, he and I heated this thing up. We put it all together. So I guess I should go back for a minute. On the right there, we put those three parts together and then to hold them together, we cast another band of plaster around it. And I mixed, uh, mixed sand in with the plaster to kind of let, you know, makes it a little more resilient to heat and uh, lets it breathe a little better. But getting that stuff very dry was of utmost importance. So I had to keep it, you know, the plaster will crack if you heat it too fast. So you have to, I put it in the kiln for, what was it, like 250 degrees and left it there for uh, 36 hours before I heated it up to, um, I think we did it, do you remember what we did the casting at? 1300 degrees or something like that. It was, uh, it was and it, Probably would have been better if it were hotter, but uh, we cast it, poured the metal in. We, you know, we're using an acetylene torch. We weren't trying to, you know, recreate how you melt metal with charcoal fire or anything like that. <laughs> this was about mold making. That's the problem I was trying to solve. So we're breaking out the um, the mold, and I was so thrilled when I saw saw this. Jesse's not here, is he? Jesse took these pictures. He can tell you how thrilling that moment was. <laughs> And uh, there is the piece after it's been cleaned up. You can see the risers that I built into it right here. And they didn't rise all the way up to the surface of the mold. So the, the metal was, or the, the mold material was hot, but it still chilled the metal. And also the sharpness of the, of the lines here, they're not as sharp as the, as the mold was. I did some other tests, not completely carving like this, that shows that you can get them sharper if, you know, with, with practice and changing some of the variables. One of the disappointments of this was that they were, um, uh, you know, a little bit rounded where the, as the original is very, very sharp. The, the, the bronze itself has never been analyzed. If you looked at it, it's gold, but it's gilded bronze. And uh, it's never been analyzed. This, this bronze has been analyzed. Um, and it's about 91% copper and 9% tin. <coughs> if there were more tin in it, if there were tin and zinc, or tin and zinc and silver, it would bring the melting temperature down and be more fluid and more likely to, uh, to fill nice and sharp. So when I originally was looking at the uh, Arda chalice, I'm thinking it must have taken them a year to carve it. But um, it took like about 13 hours. It really went. Once I learned how to do it, it was, it was, you know, it's like, whoa, this wasn't so hard after all. I did make it a little bit bigger than the original because when it, my first several attempts at the actual size were, it, it, they were just too clumsy. They were a little beyond my, my skill level. So this, uh, it could have been done, you know, sharper probably with a, with a, a different alloy. Um, when I presented that, you know, I gave you kind of a rushed version of it. I presented that at the uh, Insular Art Conference in Galway in, what was that, 2014? 14, yeah. Uh, Griffin Murray, who's uh, the one that took that picture of me with the chalice, he was, uh, he had just released a book on the uh, Cross of Khan, which is a 12th century processional cross, and, and one of the other great masterpieces of, of Celtic art a little bit later, actually sort of a time of revival. And I asked him after he gave his presentation on some aspect of the Cross of Khan, how he thought those panels were cast or made. He said, well, he definitely thought they were cast because he'd, he'd been involved in taking it apart, cleaning it, and had, you know, probably knows more about this piece than anybody ever will, possibly. And, uh, his book was meticulous and thorough and went to all kinds of detail. I wonder, who's he writing this for besides me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So uh, anyway, um, in looking at this piece, I think that has to be, it was carved in the negative. I can, I see that. It's, it's, um, 
you could pierce something out like that. You could make it in wax. There's other ways to do it. But I look at this now and I said, carving that in the negative would be uh, the most efficient way to do it. But to cast it, you'd have to have your mold very hot because these very thin uh, channels are going to cool too quickly. If you pour your metal in at the same temperature I did the, um, you know, the brooches or the stem, it's, it's going to freeze before it fills all those little, little uh, thin capillaries. So it seemed much more likely that this was done in clay, and it also seemed much more likely because clay, um, you can carve clay, you just can't carve it the way to do chip carving. But if you leave a little island, and these pieces are, you know, there's space between these, these paths of these, these little beasts. Uh, Griffin sent me a scale drawing, and, um, and <laughs> Betty, who was here earlier, was, liked to watch me work at it. <laughs> And I, I carved the, the design out, leaving the, the original surface uh, on the plane between the, um, this was carved in like a leather hard kind of thing. It was, it was not totally dry, but it was nearly dry. And then I re-wet it in order to seal it up on a flat piece for the back, and created a funnel and we, uh, we poured it. This is, uh, Lindsay, my uh, a jeweler that works with me, she did an apprenticeship with me, and it still works there. She's working today, actually. And here it is cast. It didn't fill entirely. You know, I, it could have been better if I had, if it was my job to make these, I could have redone it in two or three tries. I might have been able to get it, get it done really well. So here's, the, here's a picture of the final result, which shows the drawing at the original size and then the, the somewhat incomplete casting, which you can see has shrunk quite a bit. And then the, what remains of the, of the clay mold, which is basically the same size as the, um, as the bronze piece. And um, I think this demonstrates quite well that this is, this is the way things were done in those days. Now, I'm not about to start carving <coughs> molds in clay and, uh, to, because uh, I've got some more and some other ways of doing things. And we do, I do carve a few molds in plaster sometimes for, for some of my designs. But uh, when I first learned to do this, I started doing some knotwork pieces. Actually, this piece in the center, I call St. Patrick's Cross because I did the carving on St. Patrick's Day in uh, whatever year it was, 2006, I think, or seven. And, uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, it's about an inch and a half tall or so. And there's a, you can also do it for other things besides interlace. You, know, you can do key patterns, you can do, you can do lots of things. Um, that thistle was carved in the negative. I learned a lot of things work well. Um, when they're blackened in the background, you don't really see the, the faceted negative space quite as well as you do on that, that little knot on the left-hand side that's uh, up there. But, and then here's some other pieces which are using little units which are um, cast. You know, these, these rings are made using several different techniques. I'm you know, bending wire to do the filigree. I'm casting, uh, um, casting parts using lost wax. I'm doing chip carving and then making molds to uh, reproduce them in lost wax because it's, you know, you can, uh, and uh, actually this piece up on the top here, this is uh, done with a 3D printer. So I've gone from the 9th century to the 21st century. Uh, it prints a resin, but actually understanding the way, you know, a lot of times if you carve uh, a knotwork pattern in, um, or an interlaced pattern from say a board or a flat piece of wax or something, you're going to tend to lay out a, a path and then notch it in for the where it goes under. But if you carve it in the mold, you can have it so it sort of like really follows more of a contour over and under. And uh, and, and some of the way of understanding that I, I gained made it much easier to do the CAD work to do um, to do the um, 
you know, these, these kinds of things in, in uh, you know, kind of a virtual computer realm. So, what are we doing for time here? Oh, we're 12 a lot, I better get some lunch. So. <laughs> Questions or? Um, yeah. Okay. This this ring here is my wife's. Are you wearing it? No. <laughs> that ring has got about a four thousand dollar stone in it. Um, so that ring, actually, I, I consider that one of the best rings I ever made. And um, this other one with a sapphire. I mean, this, the value of the stones is. Quite high, but these rings, I, you know, they start around twenty four hundred dollars. You know, I do some that are a little bit narrower and smaller that might be eighteen hundred. But uh, and you know, this is something I, you know, Lindsay here has has done rings in the same style, and and the other Lindsay has also done them. <laughs> so, uh, but I think this is something that really worked well for us because uh, nobody else is doing anything quite like this. So it's. Uh, you know, when I started making Celtic jewelry, I had a very um, fortunate timing that I was making interlaced rings that people were looking for and they couldn't find. You know, they had imagined them even if they'd never seen them. And they, and I was making them and, you know, they're easy to sell when your customer already has imagined it and already wants it. <laughs> but, but, and that was like in the early 90s. But then by the late 90s, there's all kinds of hack jeweler manufacturers were cranking them out. There were rings being made in Indonesia by the bazillions that were wholesaling for four dollars. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, so I, I kind of rode this, this wave of popularity and had a little bit of a, an exclusive on it for a few years, you know, when I was, you know, kind of learning how to run a business and learning how to make things efficiently. And then as I started having a lot of competition, and also the internet made it really easy for people to find my competition, um, I made the leap into this sort of thing. And here again, it's a, uh, one of the secrets to this is some pretty high-tech stuff. Um, they're assembled with a laser welder, which uh, makes it so you can put different colors together and do very discrete welds so that they, you know, if you solder, the solder has a color too and it flows around the piece. And, I'd been trying to do things kind of like this for many years, and they, um, you know, the solder was always a problem, you know, with fine detail like this. But uh, the laser solved that problem, and it gave me a, um, you know, it, it made it so I could stay in, uh, stay competitive in the, in the business reality of, of all this stuff. So, any other questions? Anybody hungry? Yeah. <laughs>